Today's interview is with columnist, publisher, and host, Yolanda T. Marshall. Greetings and good mornings, listenership. This morning, we, we have with us Ms. Yolanda T. Marshall. Ms. Marshall, welcome to Tropical Literature Creatives. Thank you, and good morning to you, too. I'm happy to be here, Kevin. Okay, thank you very much for being on our program. Um, a question I usually ask all of our persons who are being interviewed, I, I give them a scenario, and the scenario is this. Now, imagine um, you're coming, I'm coming to Guyana, and I believe that's your home country. I'm coming to Guyana, and you're leaving to go to Canada, just a scenario, and we, run, and we get into a conversation. And you, you, you're telling me, Kevin, since you're coming to Ghana, you've got to either go to a certain place, see a person, a certain person, or try a particular thing. Uh, what would you recommend to me coming to Guyana? Well, uh, first of all, um, I would recommend the places where you really get to feel Guyana and you feel Guyanese. And chances are it's not going to be some kind of a poshy poshy you know, tourist site. Mm -hmm. uh, there are few, of course, I would say, make sure you try to check out the Kaito Falls. We're so proud of it. Um, ah. It's the largest one drop fall in the world. So I would say Kaito Falls for sure. And I would say, make sure you visit Border Market. So you would get a good sense of the market people, the ongoings of where people buy their foods, mm -hmm. um, the vendors um, and such. You hear the accents, you know. It's just the passion of the people around there. I remember as a kid, I used to love going to Border, border Market with my grandmother. It was one of the places that I felt so Guyanese. Mm -hmm. And you see the rawness of the society, right? Uh, so Border Market is one of them. And then I would also say to please visit the Baghdad because I lived a good portion of my life in Guyana, in Georgetown, in North Rhineland. So the Baghdad is where you find you have the rivers and the dark water so no we don't have this big blue tropical sea in there that i bet you might be used to mm -hmm. the water is black we call it blacko <laughs> so i would say ask them to take you to the blacko you might have some nice fruit trees there you take a good swim but it's beautiful and you could see gorgeous Guyanese kids just jumping from trees right into the <laughs> river <laughs> so check that out too and of course, any kind of parties that you see around town. I know everyone likes to go to Pegasus hotels and all this stuff, but um, you know, take a ride on a minibus. I bet you might be used to that, um, <laughs> but we have those as well. Uh, but eat as many great foods as you can and the foods you don't uh, have often. And mm -hmm. that would be uh, specifically some pepper pots. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. yes. Um I mean, with, with, with details like that, I mean, if it is that you writing, you choose to like go walk away from writing, I think the tourism authority in Guyana could hire you to promote, you know, the island, well, the country and everything because yes. of section like that, I mean, I want to go. <laughs> I want to go. All right. But I mean, after you've given some details about the country, you could tell us a bit about yourself, not the stuff that we could find on like, you know, Amazon, where it gives details about your book or stuff that we'll find about on LinkedIn or anything on Facebook, stuff that we can't find there about yourself. Oh, man, what is it about myself? Well, you know, I was born and uh, raising and I travel a lot with my um, mom. I used to, I specifically recall love going to Suriname. I love Suriname. I have family there. Um, you know, I, I had the best of both worlds. Like there's a part of my life where I lived in um, in Tong, as you would say, so Albert Town. So you have little access to some water coming out of pipe and all that, you know, um, which was great. My dad is a jazz musician and, mm -hmm. you know, you get, you get, you get as especially with his family, it, it's very, very, very artsy, musical, church. It, it's, it was such a great upbringing. I love the scent of my um grandparents home on my dad's side mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. always reminded me of like wood and old books and you know when I came to Canada I found myself visiting libraries just to like get that scent again you know um I love sniffing old books but people don't know that it reminds me of that home and quite often I dream of that home I dream of that colonial style home I would walk in the whole house throughout it, the windows you know just a whole wall of it windows 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 and the blinds blowing through and there are times I dream about that place um 
And yeah, I think it ignites the scent of old books in me. Um, the music, the guitar, the wooden guitar. Uh, I love that. And you know, I think if you walk into my home right now, you will find that I have armoires and my table all hand carved and it has wood because it, it just stems from growing up in this certain part of Guyana with this subset of family, right? And I was a barrel child. So you would want to know how come you're with your grandmother in this? Because I was a there's a point in my life I was a barrel child where you're, mm-hmm. you know, I was with my my parents divorced when I was five, and I was mm-hmm. with my mom, of course. And then her thing was, you know, she went to India to travel for to study actually to um, get her um, her degree there, and mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. she came to Canada and you know to send for us, and you know how that goes she has to work here for a while and then send for us we were barrel kids we're bouncing between families and then on her side of the family they're in the rural part so I had this taste of mud up to my knees dodging snakes you know dodging oh. electric eels hey. more than likely catching um catching what do you call this there's you know the sores on your foot <laughs> ringworm a few times <laughs> Uh, in the back dam that I spoke of, when you don't have water, you have to walk all the way there, fetch a bucket of water on your head, in your hands. Um, you used to run and, 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 and catch kin and all that kind of stuff. So I had that part of my life, too, where I found a lot of kids in Guyana didn't, wasn't exposed to, you know, that would be the, the rough ends of things. You know, at night you're walking, you have to carry a little cutlass in case just to be safe as a young girl. Yeah, and yeah. I would have to say that I've, I've lived a safe life in that area. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I, I really, I really do. I, I appreciate the um, night and day experience of the country. So this is where I'm from. This is the mm-hmm. upbringing that shaped me in a way. And I found when I came here, I preserved all of this. I preserved it in a sense of my memories. Mm -hmm. I preserved it in a sense of how I created a home around me. Even in my friends that I have here, I have my Trini friends, my Jamaican friends, I have everyone. (laughs) I keep hearing that constant accent in my head, Mm -hmm. which is great. Either a lot of us are born elsewhere, like myself, we're immigrant kids, um, or they're born here and their parents are Caribbean and that accent is so thick. You would think they're born back home. So I've, like really surrounded myself with that atmosphere and that community here. And um, and that's something about me. And I just, yeah, I don't think I've shared that enough because people are like, you know, you're so into Caribbean, how you know all this stuff? Well, you know, it never mm-hmm. dies, especially when you grasp onto the beauty of it and you try to preserve it. And uh, it's shaped the way I write, why I write and the topic you find me hinting on in my, in my picture books. I, go right back to that hardcore raw Caribbean stories and feel and sense and dance and taste so um that's a little something about me like I would say I haven't shared much or maybe not at all <laughs> <laughs> no I mean you shared a lot with us there just now you know I mean you were talking about how it is that things we in the Caribbean and a lot of things that you spoke about there I could relate to in person and I guess a lot of other persons in the Caribbean could talk about as well I mean, when you spoke about some of the things that you could preserve, um, that you wanted to preserve when it is that you found yourself abroad. I mean, I was thinking to myself, man, I hope she doesn't have to like walk with a cutlass still or to carry like water on her head or anything like still or anything like that, you know. But at least something's changed. At least something's changed for the better. I mean, I mean, you mentioned a whole a bunch of experiences there and a lot of things you were exposed to. I mean, with the writing that you had to do, I mean, you could think of any of the any of the experiences that you would have had, or any of the skills that you would have acquired that would have helped in or contributed to your writing. Yes, of course. Um, along with the preservation of my experiences in um, Guyana, yeah. um, I had amazing teachers. I do recall, and, and and I mean, I'm coming from a musical family, so I I you know I'd have to say on my dad's side they all play instruments, most of them. My grandfather, my grandmother, you know, my uncle, my aunts, my dad is a jazz musician, and especially in the Caribbean, you know how it is. Everyone has soca and reggae predominant, um, predominantly. That's the music, um, but I had jazz, which was so awesome, and I, I you know you didn't really appreciate that appreciate that until you're older. You realize like. What? Like, you know, that was actually cool for a Caribbean kid to be exposed to, right? Um, and I so I come from that background and he's so free spirited. My mom 
is so creative. She can make anything from her hands. Um, Tabul says, you know, my mom came here. My mom's, my mom's a scholar from Diana, you know, um, well-educated, highly educated. And she came here and, you know, these, when, when I, I think of immigrants like that, they come here, they work hard. I remember when she sent for us, when we came here, we were in a house that she owned. She purchased a condo. My mom came here and bought a home. So we came from like the gutter straight into a condo where I had my own room and TV because my mom worked that hard, two jobs. And I always remember she goes, yeah, we can make money doing this. And she used to take these little towel sets and make like all these creative little bunnies and stuff, like anything she can do. I mean, right now she's retired. She's selling beef patties and pint tarts and cheese rolls. Like, yeah. hello, this is where I'm from. So with, with that background, it's yeah. so easy for me to have this artistic um, ability as well as naturally this business sense that I don't, I never say I have a business of an entrepreneur, but mm -hmm. I've naturally just floated into that. I wrote a book and I marketed myself and it sold. And even if there are times I didn't market myself, yeah. I made it in a way and I had it on the right platforms where I know I can sit back mm -hmm. and it just lures people in. Because mm -hmm. I knew I was putting out products and books that I didn't see as a kid. I didn't see out there. So mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, when people see this, it's going to be like, whoa, you know, what is this? This is this is real. Like, yeah, I can relate to this. So um, I would have to say the my my parents, um, my family around me naturally, I think it's just the genetic code, you know, the artistic feel of it. And seeing my mom as a hustler, in a sense, mm -hmm. Um it shaped me into the author that I am. As you know, I started self-publishing. So oh. once again, automatically, yeah, I did my first self-published book while I was in the University of Toronto. Uh, the Obeifo, yeah, I went yeah. a journey into the mind of Miss Marshall. And that was in 2008. <laughs> like way back then, a collection of like 174 poems or whatnot I've uh, accumulated in that book. And I did that on my own. And I did a book launch and it was great. And then I went silent because, you know, life, you know, you got to work got to pay off that uh university debt yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff you know and then of course after the birth of my son I went looking for books and I realized there weren't books to represent him as a Caribbean child and it was like okay I can write I can write poems you know when I was a kid oh this I is Miles write songs for my dad huh? okay oh this is Miles Miles yeah that's Miles so when he was born, I was like, there's no books like, you know, it's really, if you're going through your life, you don't have kids, you don't really pay attention to these things. I mean, I'm aware. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not aware to like, we don't have representation, right? Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. coming from a generation where we know we don't have representation, but we just stay strong and keep pushing, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and whenever we find it, we get it. But after holding a baby and you're like, whoa. There are no books. And I'm like, I know how to write poems. I started at eight years old when my dad plays guitar. And then I would be there like singing songs and making up rhymes. And <laughs> naturally, all of that, all of yeah. that is what formed what you see today. Um, you know, that's 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 the inspiration that I acquired from my family and those around me as a kid. And then I wrote uh, Command's First Carnival, which is a short poem, right? And turn that into a book but um a lot of my upbringing a lot of the, the the family that i had around me the arts you know the love of literature uh my dad used to take us to like shows of painting in the gardens and jazz bands and so you'd find like especially in my um in my books of a lot of food mm -hmm. everyone in my family cooks all my uncle cooks i cook like Food is always there. Like food <laughs> is a genetic code to our society, so to our community and, and, and you know, for Caribbean. I know where you're from if you tell me your national dish. Let's put it that way. We okay. we're family in the Caribbean. <laughs> but if a Trini say I eat palau, I know what that palau tastes like. Hey, it's pilau, pilau. Pilau, you know? <laughs> I know you know. You know what's so funny? I, I wrote a book about that. And I'm like, you know, Tanzania, the kid is pilau. Uh, Palau, and then it's like Trini, it's, it's Pilau. <laughs> <laughs> I better get that for now, you know, curry chicken, chicken curry. Oh, I better get it right. Oh get my it goodness, right. you, you just <laughs> that kind of woman say with that curry chicken, chicken curry thing, you know. I had that in, I have that in one of my books. It, it, it seems for carnival. I go, yeah. R is for roti. When do you eat it with chicken curry or curry chicken? <laughs> listen, listen, I understand. I know, I, I play neutral. I play neutral because. 
I know my people. You better have some rights. You better have recognized. <laughs> no way I could have put in that book. You know, oh, oh you, you eat roti with a with a chicken curry. You'd be like, look at this guy, he's this what, what ship is this? Like, you know, but I had to play it right. I had to play it So, you know, but yeah, that's the thing. It's like, we can talk about food. And I know this This is my brother from here, you know. So food is, is included in there. Um, of course, music. I, and I really love soca music because growing up, it is the most authentic. It, it still belongs to us in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. It is not so mainstream where somebody from only Timbuktu could come and sing this thing. They can't take that from us, you know, in a sense. It is authentically us, right? It might take decades before they capture that, that the twang, the accent, the dialect, the terms, and everything. They're going to have to start all the way from Kaiso, Calypso, to get to the Soka, you know? So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's so authentically Caribbean. And I, I hold on to it and I keep putting it in my books to just make people know like this is how we this is how thick I'm coming from you know this is this is how Caribbean it is like in my literature so um you know I I oh man I love capturing everything Caribbean everything authentic in a sense you know and um and I do love linking it back to the history of my people like I always say it's just not me I come here with a whole army you know, I like to mention because you come from proud people and, you know, we grew up that way. So I carry that forward in my um, writings and um, my representation. If you're representing people, you have to represent it fully. You have to represent the knowledge. You continue to learn, you know, and to grow. But uh, yeah, yeah, it came from childhood all the way now. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you spoke about representation and I think I see that in nearly all of your writings. Obviously, the book I wanted to talk to you about was Miles in the Caribbean, but there were other items that I saw that you did as well that stand out as well. You wrote the book about Sorrel and there are a number of other items. And when I see these books, I'm like, yo, this is this is the Caribbean. This is us. I can identify with this. And you know, and it, it, it just made me feel a bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? As I could identify with it, I could have appreciated the content. So that's personally why I like your literature. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I love and I love when adults feel, you know, adults feel seen as well as kids. Um, and I do find my books are drawing attention. I have a lot of adults who buy my book that don't have kids. Literally, I'm doing a book signing. It's like, sign it to me. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> no. But it's because they've never, you imagine being born here and you don't have a real full concept of the Caribbean. A lot of times, they get feedback, mediocre feedback from their parents who aren't fully aware as well. Um, yeah. And they're still learning in a sense. So when you write a book and they could be like, well, like Sweet Sorrel Stan is, it's more of like financial literacy for kids. It teaches them how to be entrepreneur. Because mm -hmm. I have this belief, I says, you know, if you don't know your culture, you know, the history, you don't know the foods, you don't know all the artifacts that it comes with, people will bottle it or package it and sell it back to you. So Sweet Sorrel Stan was like, okay, let's learn what sorrel is. And in that book, I put sorrel is from West Africa. And I had a lot of dolls going, I didn't know that. Yes, it came on the slave ship and it was medicine. And it's still, people still drink it. It's called Zobo in um, Nigeria, in Ghana, in West Africa. They drink it every yeah. day. For us, we were like, oh, it's a Christmas thing, but this stuff is really good. And it it helps with blood pressure and, you know, it has a lot of the vitamin C and whatnot. So it's medicinal. Yes. So when I said that, you had adults going, wow, I never knew that. It's like you hit the spot because then it gives the younger generation an advantage to understand this. And people yes. who are not from a Caribbean nation to go like, hey, this is deeper than it is. And mm -hmm. here are these kids going, yeah, I'm going to make this. You know, I can make lemonade, which is great. But could you imagine selling sorrel? Like, that's even better. Like, the you know, these people, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the history of it and um, have something you're proud of, of selling, right? And don't let anybody bottle it and sell it to you. That's yours. Our ancestors brought that for us, right? Um, so that book has such a deep meaning. And of course, you know, you have a piece of black cake for Santa. Like growing up, I've always seen like white Santas. I grew up in a wooden house back home. I was like, where's Santa coming you know, Santa coming through the window on a block coach, you know, just, I used to be like, don't put the kerosene oil next to the <laughs> of the light. I used to, I was a kid, you know, like, because he might throw down the lamp and burn up the place and he out, like, 
because you're fe- like in your mind is like this white sand is going to jump through my window or something <laughs> so mm-hmm. because this is all you see but as you get older you're like no we could have black santas we're gonna have black santas and then you're here and everyone's like cookies and milk for santa i'm like no nah, i waited for my mom's sorrel mobby ginger bear and black cake like <laughs> no we're gonna leave that out for santa right and then you have a kid and it's like miles like you talk to miles miles literally would tell his school what he was like in kindergarten they go miles what are you leaving for Santa? he goes black cake and sorrow it was like because that's really that's what we have and yeah you want to teach them that and you have you know that book starts out with uh and i know you will relate to this the first scene is like the parents are painting the house and the dad is like it's beginning to smell a lot like christmas and then the kid goes it's just a scent of paint and it's like no 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 we caribbean Mm -hmm. people no no we know what that is yeah we know we know. know We know. So I really try to capture that um, in the book. My Soka birthday party as well is the same thing, like introducing like the foods, the history and African kids, Caribbean kids going, yeah, we have the same things. And of course, um, miles away in the Caribbean is just an accumulation of, you know, different aspects. But um, yeah, we need that. And it, it appeals to the older generation and the younger one to feel seen and represented and I you know I always want to make sure that it touches on that it's the books that I never had growing up so once I know it's a book that I didn't have growing up I know parents are reading it going like wow like this is for me you know this is literally for me like they'll read it for their kids and go back and read it again for themselves as in like we didn't get this and it, it hits like a, a note it's it's sad like every time I write a book at the end of it and it's so great there's a part where I feel like I want to cry because it's like I never had this like and I write it that's what I know it's good because it's like I wish I had this as a kid I wish I had it as a kid so here I am reliving it with my uh little seven-year-old <laughs> well I mean I, um, this is just me putting in my two cents because I know that I mean your intent might just be for your children and so on but when I read your book Miles in the Caribbean I didn't think of it just being a children's book you know this is just my thought I'm thinking this is something that could be used for probably tourism um imagine I'm on an airport yes. I'm just you know sitting just waiting to for the flight for the flight to board and I'm flipping through this book and and I don't want to talk too much about miles in the Caribbean because I'll just give you a little time to just talk about the book yourself yeah. but um but I'm flipping through the book and I'm like I mean these and it it talks about different things in the islands and I'm like man, I didn't know that stuff like this existed. And it opens my eyes to what is out there. And it makes me excited. It shows me there are options. And I'm thinking for something like tourism, even though you know it might be intended for kids, the way that it's put across, the way the message is conveyed, I receive the information really readily, really easily. And I walk away with a lot of stuff being added to me like that. So that was just my takeaway from Miles. I, I thought it was more like a, a tool for tourism and not just uh, something that could be used for children. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Was that your intent? Have persons told you anything like that? Mm-hmm. Um, that was my intent. When I first write that, wrote that book, there wasn't a book like that to really put, and I, 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 I focused on Caricom Nations, if you notice, the 15 full members. Yes, because, yes. you know, I, I, I write Cam- Common Entrance in Guyana, so uh, I know my team. And I said, let me just focus on this. These are the, this, this is a community. And one of the aspects of the CARICOM, one of the main goal is uh, economical reasons mm-hmm. as to why Barbados, Diana, Jamaica, and Trinidad decided we need a community to start this. And you have 15 nations and they're a part of the Caribbean community because they are Caribbean people in countries and nations that and islands that felt, you know, were one in a sense, mm-hmm. shared mm-hmm. history, share economical growth. And there wasn't a book that took a child into these Caribbean places and taught about them, specifically even a ca- Canadian kid, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was already living this life. My son has already traveled to 13 countries before the pandemic, before four years old. Miles has already, yeah, he's touched so many caribbean countries and loves it i mean we'd be in the in the marketplace in castries market in St. lucia eating the food and like this is the kind of stuff this baby loves mm-hmm. and we were already just we we're living that life and i work in, in, in uh publishing so uh 
naturally I started looking around. I did my research. There's no books like this. And I'm like, okay, easy. I could do that. I have Miles, who is miles away. So I work play on his name. <laughs> One of the things you will notice about my books, mm. and before that, you see a piece of black ink for Santa, you'll notice that I go right back, Sweet Sorrel Stan. There's a line in there where the mom, uh, while the sorrel is cooling down, she went to the Caribbean store. Because innately, I love to send my readers back into my community to spend money. When you read my book, where did yeah. I get my ingredients? Where did they go to buy stuff? In a Caribbean store. Mm-hmm. In Piece of Black Cake for Santa, same thing. Inside the store, they're shopping. On the wall, in the illustration, Big John's Caribbean store. That's an economical, that's, 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 that's an economical placement. I want my readers to know that I want you to go in my community and shop in my Caribbean stores, right? Mm-hmm. I want to send you there. I want to normalize that thought to you. Not just your regular grocery stores. We got Caribbean stores too, right? So I do that on purpose. And this book as well is pretty much the same thing. I want you to travel to these places. And I identified all, and I travel as a a young girl to many places. So I know what monumental places are in these countries that are so different than others. I mean, a lot of times we have the same things. But what is so different? Like in Haiti, a rara parade. And people are like, I didn't know right, Ra Ra Parade is like a Haitian. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I've never seen that in a book. It's like, yeah, I can say a parade. I can say a day. Go here on a mountain. No, 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 no. Ra Ra Parade. The rawest form, uh, form of like celebration in Haiti. I wanted to highlight that. Mm-hmm. You know, Montserrat and them having one of the biggest uh, Irish parades in the world next to Ireland. I really wanted to highlight that aspect of that um, nation. In Suriname, they're eating pom. Pom is a dish that has evolved over the centuries in um, Suriname, and it has been influenced by Jewish, Indian, African. It's the weirdest thing. It's like everyone has like formed this dish, and it's like you're gonna have a taste of this. And there's actually a place called the Witch's Market, because you know you had like you know of course we we are African descendants of Africans who've been mm-hmm. taught. To- you know, disregard our religions and our beliefs and such. But so many of our ancestors have preserved their ways of healing, um, spiritual protection. And the witch's market in Suriname is a historical place. And it's still there. It's called the witch's mm-hmm. market. So when you go there, go look for it, right? Don't let it scare you. It's wonderful. Um, and, of course, Jamaica, you have, like, the Dunge River Fall. Miles actually spent his fourth birthdays in that fall, <laughs> which was so nice. And... Um, you know, and, and skanking to reggae song. I didn't want to say something like just dancing. You have to skank. You have to skank to the song, right? Like all these little <laughs> terms. And Trinidad, you know, you got to soca, steel pans. The birth of soca and steel pans has to be mentioned in Trinidad, where you get the best parade. Um, and of course, you know, Dominica has an active volcano. You know, it's like, you know, we flies over the volcano, don't want to burn his toes. Yes. Barbados, yes. you know, cheese on bread is cuckoo and fly fish, the terms. Because, you know, when we when you go to, to Barbados, you're excited, you say cheese on bread. I wanted to bring the terms and how you say it. You know, Jamaica Madea, you have the dialects and whatnot. So that book is written on purpose to teach kids here about the Caribbean, but more so to have people who live here and you see the UK flag on the on the spaceship he has and you have the American flag to say hey when you're reading this book I hope it encourages you um to uh visit one of these nations and I know for sure you're gonna find this place there and every time I read that book I always have Canadian kids or American kids if I do virtually you know are these places real and it's like yeah they're real like these are real places because they'll think it's not real, like black sand between your toes, just black sands because of the volcano activities and such. They can't believe it. You know, St. Vincent, you have cobblestones uh, building and you have like the walrus and the whales in close proximity to the shores. And um, but people always feel like, is this real? Like they can't believe it, it exists. And it's like, nope, this is real. You're going to see a lot of those monkeys and sinkets, you know, they're going to try to grab something. <laughs> so um that that book was on purpose to encourage my readers to fall in love with the Caribbean 
explore the Caribbean because the more they travel to the Caribbean, yeah, uh, it's um, it benefits our Caribbean nations economically and have a respect for it. You know, don't go in there thinking it's just some. Um, you know, I, a lot of times, a lot of immigrants who come here, they think becoming a banana boat from some swinging from from tree or something. And it's like, no, we came from proper places. We mm -hmm. came from beautiful yeah. homes. We came from places you got to pay a lot of money to visit, and you're going to respect it because we love it and we remember it, and we're going to share it with you. So, um, that's 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 on purpose to encourage tourism into the Caribbean, and I wish more. Caribbean nations are aware of that and, and, and pick that book up and look in the history mm -hmm. of who's written books. Since I've written that book, a lot of other authors have um, adopted that same concept in books, which is great because it's like, let's send them right back into the Caribbean. I've had a lot of Caribbean um, schools purchase that book, which was awesome to see. Like, and, and I hope it continues to grow. And I made that book so affordable, it's $8 for the paperback. And that is on purpose. I make zero that when I signed up with a traditional publisher, yeah. my traditional publisher adopted like right away a piece of black cake for Santa because it was a huge seller, thousands mm -hmm. of units at Christmas time on my own as a self publisher. They grabbed that. And, but um, Miles Away in the Caribbean it wasn't adopted. And I said, you know, that's just literally gonna be out there i make zero royalty from that book whoa and it's price it's printed by ingram just to make sure it has international it has worldwide distribution because once it's on amazon it's in japan it's in india it's in the uk anyone can get it right yeah, um yeah. and i priced it at eight dollars um you know and i make nothing off of it uh and it's, it's done on purpose to have people have access to learning about the Caribbean. So that book is always going to be on there. And there are times I give the ebook for free um, as well. And I'm, I'm open to doing that for schools in the Caribbean too. If they ever contact me and says, you know, there's a digital copy, you know, read it for the kids and whatnot, because I'm, I'm very, very uh, dedicated to teaching people about the Caribbean, um, making sure the knowledge is there to eradicate the ignorance and the biases people hold. Um, so yeah. that book is for me is a gift to society and, and more so for my Caribbean people to know that I love them and I miss them and I have nostalgia <laughs> and I talk about them all the time. And I think it's, it's such a beautiful place that everyone in the world need to go to and experience. Uh, I mean, you said a lot there, Marsh, Miss Marshall. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, just. I just want to switch gears a little. I mean, one thing that I can't deny is that you have a passion for the Caribbean. You have a passion for writing. And one of the things I was doing before I started this project I was doing is I did some research and your name came up. And it seems that you had a podcast as well. And you were interviewing other mm -hmm. authors who either had, you know, writings and were based in the Caribbean or based elsewhere, but had like the same goals like yourself, which is to put together literature and to bring attention to items that are happening in the Caribbean. You could just tell me a little bit about the podcast and about your experiences with that. Yes. And that's another thing in, in terms of it. So it's like, I, of course, would do that. And it started, I, I did, I, when did I start that podcast? 2017, 2018 was a while. I'm like, okay, we have, my books are out there. And I was, you know, once again, surfing through and I'm buying books from authors in the Caribbean. And I found a lot of self-published authors mm -hmm. that I would, um, uh, buy books from because I thought it was like just amazing and the whole goal of that podcast was to share other authors so I was literally getting authors who were based in the Caribbean yeah. to show Caribbean parents here like hey like it's not just about finding like look look their books there like you know go for it it's on the pl platform you can buy it on Amazon or you can just visit their site see what they're about and what's going on so um, I wanted to share the work of other writers, uh, publishers, artists who are in the Caribbean and um, just, just highlight it. I want to make sure that when people go into iTunes and they look up Caribbean, boom, it comes up and it's like, wow, we have authors here. We have books, you know, we can explore buying books from the Caribbean. Um, and even authors here with Caribbean uh, background, I, I, I wanted to like share their work as well. And I'm so for that. Like I, you know, I think, at times when you when you're in the industry and you're publishing, I've I've run into a few very like, you know, troubling 
communication with people who are on this plot to like, you know, competition and money. And it's like, okay, I can't really relate with you. I'm on a whole yeah. different aspect. Like I'm literally for, I, um, of course we all want to make money, but you got to realize like my passion in this is my culture. I love literature and I love sharing it. And I love sharing everyone else who's with it. Like I am never going to walk into a room and talk about just myself. You're going to look me up and I want you to see like a hundred other authors like you know and I'm gonna say here here get this book this is gonna you know like I'm not gonna just put my books on the list I'm gonna say by the way here's like a hundred other authors like that's just me naturally Mm -hmm. right so me giving shine to other authors doesn't take away from myself at all at all my library has my books my library has all of their books and this is for my child and this is for other um children out there so I love to feel like there's an army of other people out there right so I want to share it And I want to like celebrate them and I want to shine light on the work they're doing because it's great. And I go way back. I'm like, whoever wrote, there's books that people wrote that went out of print. And I'm just like, what? Like, it's so sad. Like, you know, we, we got to like keep this movement going because that's just just my thing. Um, Not just shining a light on my work, but also on other authors. Like that's just me naturally does not dim me in any way and that's what that podcast was around like you know here's some recommendation as a parent right as a parent this is what I want I want to show it off and what's funny about that podcast is that it has escalated all the way now to where I am a columnist in the Caribbean camera news it's the biggest um, newspaper in um, Canada and I have an entire column. At this point in time, we took a short break, after which we reconvened the interview. Uh, we're here with Yolande Marshall, and we were talking about uh, the podcast that she had put together. So, Yolande, I mean, before it is that we went for a break, you were telling us a bit about your podcast. Uh, would you be able to recount and go back into the area that you were before it is we went to our break? Yes, yes. So I did mention my podcast and how it highlights the work of um, other Caribbean authors um, based in Canada, the UK, the US, and within the Caribbean region. Um, Because as as I said, I love to shine light on my work, but I also love to shine light on the amazing work of the uh, authors and publishers and illustrators we have in the Caribbean region and, and, and throughout the Caribbean diaspora. And of course that, took me to the level where now I'm a columnist for Caribbean Camera, which is our largest uh, newspaper in Canada. And this space, it's a, it's a, it's a newspaper that's published bi-weekly. Mm-hmm. And this space allows me to highlight all the books and the authors. So there are times I'll do like an interview with an author, but I try to make sure I show the books as recommendations. And I love talking about, you know, this author is a, Jamaican heritage or Trinidadian heritage or African, but it's for racialized um, uh, authors uh, throughout the diaspora. And yeah, that's my space. And I get to highlight all these amazing books that people weren't aware of. So when I started, that was last year. So like almost a year ago, I started that column. And the reason why is because at this point I was getting into like, big newspapers like the Globe and Mail in Canada um, and, you know, the Star newspaper. And I'm like, my books are not featured in the Caribbean camera, like the actual Caribbean camera. So I'm like, this, this makes no sense. I called up the owner and I'm like, how am I in major channels? And then my books are not featured here or as many books as I thought that uh, should be there. And um, I said, I would love to have a space where I could feature not just my book, but more so many that you're missing. We need to document it. We need to make this a space because it's also posted online for people to go to within our community, within our uh, media, to see the authors that are coming from, you know, the bosoms of the Caribbean and throughout many African nations and and, and around the world, racialized authors. So, uh, you know, surprisingly, he's like... You got it, you know. I sold myself. See, that's a business stuff. You know, I told my mom's a business person. I was like, lo and behold, he did. He does know my mom actually. He's like, uh, you're Hazel's daughter. I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't call my mom and let her know I uh, <laughs> roughed you up for the space. But she was like, 
It's like, you got it. And from then it took off. I, I literally go hunting and I looking, I'm looking for other authors and I show their books and the covers and yeah. it has a following. It's so nice when you meet, especially older readers, because, you know, our elders are big on the newspapers. They pick it up. It's a free newspaper. It's in the Caribbean stores yeah. uh, every Thursday. And they read it and they they recognize you and they're like, hey, I saw your column and they you know, they feel really good. I was like, oh wow, like people are reading this, they're loving it. And then authors too, when they're featured and their family members are like, I saw you in the Caribbean camera. Like it, it feels good. It's it's nice where when you're working so hard to make sure our society, our people, our culture is seen um, overall. It's, it's nice to, you know, feel seen yourself. And that's what I love to give back to our authors. They deserve this little light. It's like, hey, I see you. You know, we see you in the community. And I, I love sharing that with readers because, you know, we, we, we ought to celebrate ourselves and, and celebrate each other in a sense. But as I say, you know, it, it's, it's me and my family. <laughs> I come in with my family. <laughs> way. I mean, way. <laughs> I mean, when it comes to when it comes to the book Miles in the Caribbean, and you were putting it together, aside from aside from your son, I mean, was there anyone who contributed to the putting together of that book that you could think about? Honestly, I wrote that book with just my son and I. Uh, most of my books is just literally just my son and I. I had no one to bounce it out off of the you know I I I pay like the illustrator was like. 600 bucks and the mm-hmm. formatting on on fiber was like 120 bucks and that was it no there was no other contribution to that book other than myself and my knowledge um and once again it's a poem that was written quite a long one as you can see 15 ages <laughs> but it's uh it's just myself and my son and there was i no one else that contributed, I could say, that um, helped me along with that book. So, of course, after it's written and such, I would share it with my dad. And, you know, he yeah, loved yeah. it because there was a part in my in the bar, in the when he went to Barbados, because I have Barbadian heritage to my dad. So when I show my dad and Mama Kathy and Miles went there and, ah, and give them, yeah, you know, yeah. grandpa give them cuckoo. So my dad was like, you know, he felt like, whoa, look at, look, we're in the book. Like, he felt so. <laughs> proud you know like wow I made yeah. it in the story because <laughs> I was real so um and 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 of course he he loves it he just loves it you know I'm his daughter he's just like I love it all like you know but he he travels a lot as well so yeah. he could fully relate and that's when you know if you bounce it off of a parent that is a traveler and is Caribbean and is an artist like you know and he loves it it's like okay I got it this is it this is great. And I dedicated that book, of course, to every Caribbean nation, um, not just the CARICOM nation, but all throughout the region, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was just Miles and I. Literally, I wrote a lot of those books after work on the weekends by myself. Yeah. Like it was, you know, quite a lonely road with that. And in a sense, now it is, but I have a publisher. So it's, it's, a little bit more fun like you could really you have no you know you're submitting it and someone else have a a word you know to put in there um so but it's but prior to that it's yeah it's been it's been a lonely road just my son and I and once he loves it that's it (laughs) I mean we've spoken about the book but I want to inquire a bit about the publishing aspect because I know you mentioned that you did a lot of the pub well you started off um when you were in college I think and you, that yeah. first book that you did was self-published. Yeah. I mean, see, now you'd have done like different, you'd have published several books since then. Yeah. I mean, what are your takeaways from the entire publishing experience? Was it pleasant? Was it unpleasant? Do you prefer to self-publish as opposed to go to a publishing house? Well, self-publishing for me became easy. After the first one, and, and you know, you're doing children's books, it was smooth sailing from that. I'm, I'm really good with like um, technology. I worked in marketing media and, and analysts um, most of my life. So, you know, formatting documents and stuff, it's not too bad. You know, you can put together, but I was working in self in, in um, traditional publishing. So I was self-publishing my book. And then in 2011, I started working at an academic publishing company. 
And I got that job because I've had an experience with self-publishing, of course, along with all the technical aspects for the job. But it's like, what publishing experiences do you have? Well, I self-published a book in 2008. So I'm already in the field. Yeah. So it, it's quite natural. and You learn more while you're working in the field. Yes. And it made it easy for me to keep coming out with these books. And you're still learning because traditional publishing is different than self-publishing in some ways. Self-publishing, you got to do it yourself, right? And there are many other people doing it. You know, there's, you know, there's so many. And, and you just have to read and follow it through. It's not, for me, it was never rocket science. And I did it with a little baby on my hip at night, you know, yeah. and you just feel through. But at least you knew marketing platform you knew that it has to be on amazon has to be on Barnes and noble you know the timing of when it has to be on you know how to code the topic right and such so all that just went smooth sailing for me um and it built up so i've built myself up by time i got a um a traditional publishing deal that was before the pandemic just before the pandemic yeah. a multi-book deal i was signed on as a established author because I'm going with a publisher. I'm, I have this experience. I'm in, I'm a publishing professional in the field. Mm -hmm. So that publisher, Chalkboarder, was just like, perfect. Who doesn't want to work with an author like that? You know, because it's not so much they have to explain to me. I understood it. Um, what I love about the traditional publishing is that a lot of the work gets put on someone else's sense, right? So it's like I bring my manuscript and then I, ah, you know, send it two emails. Da, 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 da. All of a sudden I'm getting like a PDF and go, here it is. It's formatted. Yes. It's there is that. And you're working with an editor and you have um chalkboard is like awesome. The CEO Demi is amazing. She's been doing this forever. Educational yeah. book. So she has a different look at it, like she's learning from it. It has to be something that teaches her as an adult, you know, and someone in the publishing field. Because she can learn something about this, you've got the right product, it's authentic. So working with other people is great because you have a better insight. Um and it's, it's wonderful. I, I would have to say, I love them both. But I think the older you get and the more you start to put out, it's kind of like, yeah, I, I, like, the, I like the traditional publishing right now. I really do. I, I really do because it can get out there on, on more platforms. It gets the recognition, especially to get into libraries. Even before I was traditional publisher, I got my books into libraries. Yeah. Because as, as I said, I want my book to be available. I want it to be there, you know, it's, I'm, I'm for the love of literature right i'm not hiding it i want people to open it up when they walk into a bookstore i want to open it up when they go into a library i'm proud of my writings i want you to learn from it um so i made sure i got into libraries and then with them it was easy getting into like stores on a, on a larger level not just five or six stores like a lot more stores mm -hmm. um and so i love i love the traditional aspects of it but at the same time for me because being um working in publishing and being experienced i got the um I got the, the, I would have to say, I have so much experience that my traditional publisher has, you know, they come to you for a little bit more than they would with an average author, right? Like for more advice and more questions and whatnot, because you understand a little bit more and you could do even a little bit more work, I would say, in a sense. It's like, no, 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 you know, we have to do ABC because you have that experience, right? Uh, with many others that work for the company. So, um, but I, I, I give thanks to my self-publishing experience because it took me all the way here. And now I'm agented. So I got agented um, and my agent, of course, got me a book deal like within three months. That book hasn't it came out as yet. What I love about that, it, the traditional publishing route and having an agent, it allots you the longevity within the publishing industry. Okay. So that publisher acquired a manuscript 2020 that book's coming out in 2024 2025 like it's just it keeps that longevity in there and you know of course I know with publishers they're different they're going to be publishers where I give a manuscript to I work with an editor and I have no say in the illustration I have no say in, in many things but um you know the longevity is there and I, I really appreciate that and I think with that it benefits my community to not just put out books like, you know, here, there, and it's all this. And it's like, no, like I'm already writing for like years ahead, years ahead. By the time my kid is like 18, there's still going to be books coming out. And I feel that traditional publishing is putting me on that path to be here for a very, very long time. And I still have 
self-publishing in my back pocket. So yeah. I could still do that. We're called like the hybrid authors of the society. So, you know, we, we, could, we could still whip out books here and there, but I, I love the traditional route because the longevity in it and it, it secures you that spot to say, you know, we're not going anywhere. Like, I'm already writing books for your, for your kid when you're, you know, if you plan to have a kid five years from now, they're going to get a book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the skills that you've had there, I don't think I've encountered anybody who's had like, you know, the, 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 uh, the amount of skills that you've had. I mean, you mentioned that you started this like a really long time ago. Uh, you mentioned but you've mentioned, I mean, you have a background in marketing, et cetera. Uh, you mm-hmm. mentioned that you have like a little experience with technology. And of course, I mean, having done this stuff, having done the work, having done the research, that kind of affords you like an advantage that a lot of persons don't have. Yeah. I mean, in addition to the passion that you've had for the culture and for the fact that writing, for writing on a whole, do you think you see yourself doing like any other roles, for example, uh, uh, up and coming authors who may want to learn about self publishing, you think you'll see yourself like offering courses to persons as to the process, the paths, the benefits of either one if it is that they want to pursue either route? Um, yeah, and I do that naturally. So I do their workshops, I've signed up, you know, I've done with uh, multiple organizations to um, teach people, you know, the business of uh, publishing and such. Um, but one thing I do behind the scenes is I had I have so many authors who've always reached out to me and go, hey, like, how do I do this? And I give them that information for free, especially people within my community. I, I do that. Um, and oh. once again, it's because it benefits our younger generation. I can sit down and be like, oh, you know, I, I'm going to charge you $100 for this or whatever, and I could do that. But naturally, I don't. Behind the scenes, I try my best to answer their questions and to help them um you know and in a sense you still have to protect your space because you don't want it to attract people with not great intent you know users and abusers and stuff you know and it's it's, it's kind of like a, a tough place because you really want to help but then you still have to be on guard you know so i find like doing workshops with organizations a great way because it's like hey sign up and you're going to get it uh, get to learn about it. A lot of these platforms are free for them to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, but once again, I do have an open door policy where if someone calls me and go, hey, you know, I got this book. I don't know how to format it. I will send them and go, this com- this guy is the one to go to. Look at their reviews. They've done all my books and the years experience and they've done this book, this book, you're safe. Um, and, and help them out the best way I know because sometimes a big issue for them, for me, is something that I could solve in a minute. Or something I could see that, okay, that's only going to take you 24 hours, you know, but to them, it's huge. Um, so I do help a lot of authors behind the scene and anything, any workshops that are coming along to like, you know, tell my story and whatnot. I get involved in that and I share it like this podcast is one of them where I would share it. And, mm-hmm. you know, starring authors, I'd be, hey, visit this podcast, you can learn something, right? So and I share the work of other authors too who are giving, divulging that information to like follow them, learn about it. I, I send authors, you know, who are new this platform, tune in, learn more. So yeah, I'm forever helping my people in a sense, always. Yeah. Okay. That, that leads me to my next question. I mean, again, with the skills that you've acquired and the things that you've accomplished, I mean, your books are available in schools in some regards. Yes. If it is, I, I look at this book and I see you, Lanty Marshall, and I follow you on social media and I see the things that you've achieved and accomplished. And I want to like adopt you as a mentor. I mean, what advice would you give to me as an up and coming writer? What skills do you think I should look into? I mean, what mindset do you think I should adopt if it is I want to get into the field of writing? Well, if you want to get into the field of writing, number one, I know for sure you're a writer. You love writing, and that's great. And more than likely, you have a lot of stories to share, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would have to say learn publishing. There's so many people that get into publishing that have no clue, and they open their mouths, and it kind of like it's, it works against them, in a sense. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, in a sense, embarrassing, especially if it's coming from our community. I don't really like that. Don't talk about publishing unless you do your research understand it know who's out there what books they have out there right like you know you're not coming up with something that a lot of times have never been done before kind of a sense but you have to know the industry 
you have to learn it. I find a lot of people are writing the same books that other people have out there. Like it's redundant. You've got to tell stories that really reflect who do you stand for? What are you giving? You know, what, what, what's going to be so different about you? How are you selling yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, you're selling yourself as a business person. Are you selling yourself as someone who's about the literature, about the culture, about the people? What is it about and how you're going to present that, right? You have to build your readers and attract them to you. Um, try to be as authentic as you can because that fake thing is going to wear off at some point. And also align yourself with people who learn, you know, build a good friendship, a good relationship with people in publishing, right? Um, that helps. But I would say research publishing. Know the difference between self-publishing and publishing. You'd be surprised how many people I know want to write a book and don't know the difference between the two, right? Realize that if I'm on Indigo and Amazon, I'm, all, I'm all automatically international and that's great. And then you have to go into your bookstores. You have to venture in there. And it's just, you got to understand publishing, know the industry, um, know your competition. And it's way more. Publishing is still very white especially when you're in North America um, or in Europe, it is still very white. And there's so many publisher uh, authors out there who are fighting this huge battle to break through that barrier, like, you know, to get into schools and such, and not just for us, but for anyone else that's coming, you know, respect that movement. You really do have to. Um, but once again, know yourself, be authentic, um, have a true representation. How are you going to sell your products and yourself? Um, you know, and the longevity of it. What are you going to do 10 years from now? What's, what's your goal uh, to learn? Um, and, and stay up to date with, with, with all the new things that's coming out there, right? Audio books and such. Um, but stay up to date. But I, I, I find that writing is half the battle. The other batch is like, who are my audience and who am I selling is this to and who am I, how am I going to retain them? Right. That's the whole thing. Um, but I would say learn a lot about publishing. There's so much to publishing that I find, especially a lot of people within um, the black communities aren't fully aware of. And they really do um, need to catch up in a sense in behind the scenes, right? To know where they're going with it. And we're in the, we're in the process of where people are banning books. You know, this happens. And people are like, oh, they're banning books. Like, don't be shocked. They, they always have been. They just, you know what? Before they were loudly banning books, they wouldn't accept your books in spaces. Yeah. That's the way of banning books. And then you got in and now they're like, ah, toss it right out. Like, this is nothing new. Absolutely nothing new. It's just they've become more loud with it and blatant um, with it. So, you know, you make that 10 step forward and they want to toss you back. Oh, stay on top of that um, and keep fighting. It's not so much an easy road, but if you believe in yourself, you believe in your writing, um, chances are you will attract the right readers that will believe in you too. So keep going and don't give up. You don't ever give up. Don't let anybody tell you that your story doesn't matter. Don't let anybody tell you that, you know, what you're doing is, is not going to work and all this. Cause I've had people say that to me like years ago, oh, this stuff is just wasting your time. And I'm like, well, I don't think so. You know, that's fine. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm pushing through and, you know, kids like mine can uh, feel represented and they have been and adults are feeling represented. So the hard work does pay off. So continue with it. Keep pushing through, align yourself with, with people who are doing the same thing too. Like it's a good, good movement. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it has been a very lively and animated interview, um, <laughs> but I can't think of any other questions at this point in time. Uh, if it is that a person and wants to contact you, do you have like um, a website? Are uh, you available on LinkedIn to be contacted with regards to your book, etc.? Yes, of course. I'm on LinkedIn. I turn my entire page into like an author page on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. I'm um, you can catch me online. Of course, I have my website www.ytmarshall. That's ytmarshall.com. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also on Instagram, uh, Facebook. I don't have TikTok. I'm not a TikToker. That's for sure. That's not my marketing thing at all. Um, and when I have my Instagram, I have my Facebook, and I'm also on Twitter. And I'm also on Wikipedia. You can find me in a lot of spaces. I think if you just Google me, you'll find me. That's for sure. I, I utilized my online platform and have been for since 2008. <laughs> 
I mean, in, just one more question. If it is that we want to get access to your books, um, aside from Amazon, where can we yes. them? So my books are on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. I have my Canadian books for chalkboard, which you'll find a lot on Chapters Indigo mm -hmm. and in local bookstores. Um, but there are quite a few uh, platforms that it's uh, you will find my books. But just if you just if you once again, if you just Google the titles, it will lead you to where to purchase. But all your major uh, online platforms, you will find me. And of course, in local stores in New York and especially the New York region in Brooklyn and Queens, I my books, I have some of my books are physically in the libraries, which is so awesome. Um, and a few other states, even in L.A., which is, you know, so great. I love I love libraries, you know, so you'll find me there in Guyana. I'm there. Um, I know in Jamaica, I'm there in Barbados. I have a there's a bookstore that sells my books. So. Yeah, I'm in quite a few places, but yeah, you'll you'll find me on all major platforms and especially in Canada and bookstores and in the UK, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean so listeners, you know where it is that you can find the books and you can find the author of interest. So that brings us to the end. Uh thank you very much for your time. Um, author, podcaster, uh, from the land of many waters, Miss Marshall. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's so nice to be here. Pleasure talking with you. And, and likewise, likewise. Okay, you have a good day. You've been listening to Tropical Literature Creators. If you've liked content or heard something of interest, reach out to us. Reach out to our authors. We enjoy hearing from you. Our listenership. Follow us on social media visit our website.